Hello everybody. I've had special requests to make the scary climate change energy calculations shorter. So this is the shorter variation. Again, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. And that's what we're trying to do. Save the future. So I have a number of uh, energy calculations in this video. A boiling cup of water. Energy released an atomic bomb. Energy and carbon dioxide released in the fires of Australia. Energy and carbon dioxide released in one year of fossil fuel combustion, burning in the earth. Energy released in a one degree increase of earth's temperature. Energy required to melt all the Greenland ice, how long would it take? And my approach versus computer models. The longer version of uh, this particular topic is uh, at this a URL, and it has a lot more background of climate change and so forth. This is not nearly as complete. So again, uh, I want to start off with it begins with energy. So what is energy? Uh, we have kinetic energy, which is moving things. You can think of uh, burning the gas that moves the car and heats the engine. So you get work and uh, heat coming off from that. Or you have potential energy that's stored in the energy of gasoline in the tank, okay, and the chemical bonds. Uh, potential energy, uh, energy can be a chemical energy, radiant energy, thermal, electrical, and so forth. Okay, we have a reference unit of energy. It's uh, one gram of, of water, or one cubic centimeter of water, or one milliliter of water. Those are all equivalent to each other, just different ways of saying it. If you warm that one degree Celsius, which is also 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, which is also one degree Kelvin, that will require one calorie of energy. That's the older unit. The more modern unit is to use joules. And so one calorie equals 4.2 joules. Joules uses the scientific units of kilogram, meters, and seconds, and so forth. But we're just going to refer to joules. If you have a thousand of them, they use a kilo prefix or just a K. So if I had a thousand calories, that would be one kilocalorie, which, by the way, is one food calorie. But one kilocalorie would be 4.2 kilojoules, and that would be 4,200 joules. So just a reference point for energy. So this is a simple starting calculation. Let's look at the energy to uh, warm a cup of water that you might use for tea or coffee from uh, 25 degrees. It's kind of room temperature up to 100 degrees Celsius, which would be the boiling point of water. Okay, so that's going to depend on how much you have in your cup. So we're going to assume we have 8 ounces. There's 28.3 grams per ounce, and so that would be 226 grams. And then we're going to heat it to boiling, starting at 25, and so that's going to require 75 degrees Celsius increase. So every one of those grams and every one of those degrees it's going to come out to be 4.2 joules, all right? And so if I multiply the grams in the degrees Celsius times this ratio here, 4.2 joules per degree per gram, we get 71,000 joules. If we write that as kilojoules, 71.0 kilojoules, where kilo is 1,000. Okay, so that gives you kind of a ballpark feel for what a joule is. Uh, when you heat up, uh, say, a cup of water. Uh, we have three different temperature scales, which is a little bit confusing because uh, it, it just is. Okay, we have the scientific temperature scale, which is Kelvin. It goes down to absolute zero. There's a temperature we cannot go below. And then we heat that up. Uh, we get up to 273. In terms of Celsius, that would be zero degrees. So Celsius is an older temperature scale that defines temperature based on the um, on based on water. So zero degrees Celsius is where water freezes, and 100 degrees Celsius is where water boils. And so the difference between those two were divided up into 100 units, which would be 100 degrees Celsius. And that's true over here for Kelvin too. But the freezing point is 273, and the boiling point is 373. We have sort of the older American style unit of Fahrenheit. America still uses this. Most of the rest of the world has switched over to Celsius and Kelvin. Uh, but the boiling point in Celsius and Fahrenheit would be 212 degrees Fahrenheit. 
and the freezing point would be 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So the difference between those two is 180, and that corresponds to the 100 degrees Celsius, and that's where the 1 degree Celsius equals 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? Uh, and I have some equations down here where you can convert, interconvert those with each other. Now, the first thing I'm going to calculate here is the amount of energy released in a Hiroshima-sized atomic bomb. So, Hiroshima atomic bomb is considered to be about 12 kilotons of TNT. So, kilo members a thousand. So, that would be 12,000 tons of TNT because kilo is a thousand. One ton of TNT is 4.2 gigajoules, so we got these funny prefixes, but giga is a billion, so that would be 4.2 times 10 to the 9 joules, okay, that would be a gigajoule, and that's for one ton, but we have 12,000 tons, so if we wanted to figure out all the energy in that atomic bomb, we take 1.2 times 10 to the 4th tons of TNT times 4.2 times 10 to the 9 joules per ton, and that gives us 5 times 10 to the 13th joules of energy and 12,000 tons of TNT. So that's the size of a Hiroshima atomic bomb. I'm going to look at three different uh, fossil fuels. Actually, we're only going to use one of them, but I wanted to show the, the three that we commonly use in our world. There's natural gas, which is mostly methane. So we're going to use methane to approximate natural gas. Then we have octane which is C8H18, we're going to use that to approximate gasoline and oil. Okay, so that has eight carbons in it, a lot more carbons, a lot more hydrogen too. Okay, we'll say that's oil. And then I have this rather large molecule here, this is benzopyrene. We're going to use that as an approximate molecule of coal. Okay, so this isn't really coal, but it's sort of like molecules of coal. And uh, coal uh, is very dirty comes with a lot of heavy metals like mercury and other metals that are uh, uh, toxic to us. also comes a lot of times with a lot of sulfur. Sulfur can get oxidized to sulfur oxides, uh, sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide, and that can cause acid rain when it mixes with the water in the atmosphere. Okay, but you'll notice there's a lot more carbon in the coal or the benzopyrene and a lot lower amount of hydrogen. So there are actually more carbon than hydrogen, whereas over here there's more hydrogen than carbon, and a lot more hydrogen than carbon here. So I uh, combined each of these fossil fuels with oxygen to burn them, because all of the carbon will become carbon dioxide in a perfect combustion, and all of the hydrogen would become water. And then there'll be a lot of uh, heat liber liberated. Sometimes we can use that to do work, or maybe just to heat things up. So I have the number of kilojoules, remember a thousand joules, per mole. So a mole is an amount. Okay, it's a big number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Um, but you can think of like a dozen. So if I said, what's a dozen, you'd say 12. If I said, what's a mole, well, you have to say 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. But it's the same idea. So in the, uh, the octane, we have eight carbons. So we're going to make eight carbon dioxides. We have 18 hydrogens, we're going to make 9 waters, and then a lot more energy because there's more carbon and hydrogen. Okay. So if you look over here, methane is 75% carbon, and octane is 84% carbon. So in terms of our world and carbon dioxide, this is a little more dirty than the methane. A lot of people like methane, they say it's a bridging fuel to get away from so much carbon dioxide. And then if we look at the benzopyrene, which is our approximation of coal, we make 20 carbon dioxides and only six waters. We get a lot more energy because there's so many carbons in one mole. Okay, and so pyrene is 95% carbon. So this is going to be a lot dirtier fuel, not just because of mercury and sulfur, but because of the amount of carbon dioxide that it can produce. These uh, heats of combustion that we're looking right here, we're going to use those on the next page uh, to see uh, to see energy. So on the next page, what we're going to do is we're going to take a thousand grams of each of these guys. A thousand grams of natural gas, which we're saying is methane, a thousand grams of octane, a thousand grams of benzopyrene, and uh, we're going to convert them into moles. So the mole is an amount, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. But for methane, that's only 16 grams. 
for octane, that's 114 grams. And for benzopyrene, that's 252 grams. So in our 1,000 grams of each hydrocarbon, uh, we have different amounts of moles. We have a lot of moles of methane, 62. Uh, not as many moles of octane, about 9. And even fewer moles of benzopyrene, only about 4. Just uh, up here to give you a ballpark uh, feel for you know, people who think in more like pounds and ounces. 1,000 grams, 1,000 grams is 35.3 ounces, which is about 2 pounds and a little bit. Okay, two pounds and three ounces. So here's that mole amount, <coughs> but in terms of us, we can just think of a dozen. Okay, so 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So how much energy is released with each of these thousand grams? Well, that's why we had to convert them to moles, because the energy comes per mole. So for methane, there's less energy per mole, but we have a lot of moles. So we have 49, almost 50,000 kilojoules of energy released. Okay, that same amount of mass for the octane only has 9 moles, but more energy per mole, but still it doesn't e equal as much as the uh, burning of the natural gas, the methane. And then for benzopyrene, we only have 4 moles, but a lot of more energy is released, but doesn't come close to the octane or the methane, the natural gas. Okay, so here's another reason that coal is not as good, because per mass, we're not getting as much energy. So now we want to see how much carbon dioxide is made from each of these thousand gram amounts of a fuel. Remember, 75% carbon for natural gas, 84% carbon for octane, and 95% carbon for coal, for benzopyrene. And so the ratio of um, carbon dioxide to carbon is 44 grams of carbon dioxide per gram of carbon. And so the 1,000 grams that we have up here was 75% carbon. And so uh, that's where I get the 750 grams. Times 44 over 12, that's about 3.7 ratio. And so that's how much carb carbon dioxide I'm going to get, how many grams of carbon dioxide. So 2,750 grams. Notice that's a lot more than the 1,000 grams we started with because we're adding in a lot of oxygen to these masses. That's going to be around 6 pounds. If we took that same 1,000 grams of gas, octane, and we combusted it, we make a little over 3,000 grams of carbon dioxide, which is released into the atmosphere. That's going to be about 6.8 pounds. Remember, we're starting with about 2 pounds up here of the fossil fuel. And then down here for the benzopyrene, it's 95% carbon, so 950 grams of carbon. We're going to make a lot more carbon dioxide. So that's 7.7 uh, .7 pounds of carbon dioxide. So again, that, the coal comes out the dirtiest. The natural gas looks the best. But all of them make a lot of carbon dioxide, which is what we're trying to get away from. So our next calculation is going to be how much fossil fuel does humanity burn in a year? So what we're going to do, we're going to see how much energy that generates. What we're going to do is we're going to assume that the uh, Last year, we made about 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide. So remember, giga is a billion. That's 10 to the ninth. A ton is about 2,000, if we just use American tons, about 2,000 pounds. So we'll have to factor that in. Okay, this is released to the atmosphere. That's about what happened last year. And uh, this is dispersed into the atmosphere, which goes to vegetation. It goes into the air. It goes into the water. It goes into the land. About half of it ends up in the air, okay, which is uh, what we're trying to get away from. So we're going to assume that all of that fossil fuel was octane, like gasoline. We're going to assume all the gasoline is octane, and then we're going to combust that because we know the amount of energy per mole of this, and we can figure out how much energy is coming out of that. So this is an approximation. It's not entirely true. Uh, but we're going to convert all of that mass into of carbon dioxide into moles of carbon dioxide, okay, because up here we're talking tons. And then we're going to take those moles of carbon dioxide and we're going to go back and figure out how many moles of octane that was. And then we're going to use the moles of octane and the amount of energy that's released per mole to figure out all of the energy released in the combustion of all of the fossil fuels in one year. So over here we have our octane. Notice there's eight carbons in there. We have some hydrogen that's going to be water. 
So this is how much oxygen we need to burn it all to get to carbon dioxide, eight of them, and nine waters. Okay, so fossil fuels ideally would take um, the hydrocarbon that we have and make it into carbon dioxide and water, and that would spread around the world, the vegetation, the air, the oceans, the land. Okay, so let's start off here. The mass of carbon dioxide released from fossil fuels in one year was about 40 gigatons. Okay, we're going to convert that to pounds, and then we're going to convert that to grams, and that would give us about 3.6 times 10 to the 16 grams of carbon dioxide. So that's a really big number of grams, but we need to make it into moles. So there's about 44 grams of carbon dioxide per mole, and so I'll use the grams to cancel out and get to moles. And so now I have 8.2 times 10 to the 14 moles of carbon dioxide. So the reason I want that is because up here I have a ratio of moles of carbon dioxide to moles of octane. And that's what we'll do next. So now I have moles of octane uh, by multiplying the moles of carbon dioxide times one mole of octane per eight moles of carbon dioxide. So really we're taking about one eighth of this number. So that's about one times 10 to the 14 moles of octane. But we know the energy released per mole. So that means we can calculate all of the energy released from the burning of fossil fuels in one year. Okay, so the amount of uh, moles we have is 1 times 10 to the 14, and then the amount of uh, energy is 5 times 10 to the third kilojoules per mole. And so I'm going to multiply that times the number of moles I get 5 times 10 to the 17th kilojoules energy released per year. But I want joules. So I have to take that 1,000 to 1 ratio. So I have 1,000 joules per kilojoule. So I have to multiply 1,000 times this. And I get 5 times 10 to the 20 joules per year. All right? So our 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide produce 5 times 10 to the 20th joules per year. We're going to use this energy to compare with other amounts of energy from other things. Okay, the first thing we're going to compare to is the amount of energy per Hiroshima atomic bomb. Okay, so we just figured out that we made 5 times 10 to the 20th joules per year from combusting all of the hydrocarbons. And just a little bit earlier, we saw that we made 5 times 10 to the 13th joules of energy per Hiroshima bomb. So if we divide this, these two, we get 1 times 10 to the 7th Hiroshima bombs per year equal to all the fossil fuels that we burn. That's 10 million atomic bombs per year of fossil fuel combusted. That's pretty incredible. There's about 32 million seconds in a year. And so I took um, all that energy, all those Hiroshima bombs, 10 million of them, and I divided by 32 million seconds, and it comes out one Hiroshima bomb for every three seconds. Okay, just think about that for a minute. Okay. Now, the Hiroshima bomb obliterates about six square miles, and we're putting off one every three seconds. With, that's equal to the energy that we generate from combusting all the fossil fuels in a year. Pretty mind-boggling. Okay, so right now we have these <coughs> raging forest uh, fires in Australia. And so I thought, um, let's look at the energy released and the burning of all this uh, this forest or this vegetation to this point. Okay, this is like uh, January 13th. They're still burning it. Uh, there's going to be a lot more that gets burned. Okay, so the area of Australia is over 7 million square kilometers. And that's about 2 times 10 to the 9th acres. So what I'm going to assume from what I saw uh, yesterday, 14 million acres have been burned in Australia. So if I divide that 14 million by the total, it's about 0.7% of Australia has gone up in fires. Okay, what I'm going to assume is that the vegetation on each acre is uh, 40 eucalyptus trees that are 50 feet tall and 2 feet in diameter. So there's, uh, if you look at a eucalyptus plantation, they can grow as many as 200 trees on an acre. So I'm just picking eucalyptus trees because it's a single thing that we can use to calibrate the amount of uh, vegetation that's being burned. And I just, uh, some eucalyptus trees are as tall as 330 feet, I'm assuming 50 feet. 
<coughs> excuse me, and then the diameters can be very large. I'm just assuming two feet diameter. So I'm trying to pick kind of a middle small eucalyptus tree as our example. Now, the number of trees on 14, 000, 14 million acres, is since I'm going 40 trees per acre, it's going to be 5.6 times 10 to the 8 trees, total trees. Okay. Now, the volume of a tree, I'm going to assume is the h, that's the 50 feet, times pi r squared, and since I assumed the diameter was 2 feet, r would be 1 foot. So that could generate the area of the base, and we're going to assume it goes all the way up 50 feet. And so that would give us 157 cubic feet per tree. Now I'm going to assume all the trees are made of cellulose, not, you know, not the lignin and any other things that are there. Okay, so cellulose has a formula something like this to the end, C6H12O6. That's about 40% carbon, because what we're really concerned with is the amount of carbon that's being converted to carbon dioxide in these fires. And then I'm also going to assume that the density of cellulose, which is about 1.5 grams per cubic centimeter, is part of this. So now the mass in a tree, we have cubic feet. So what I'm going to do is convert that to cubic inches. And then I'm going to convert that to cubic centimeters because I know that the mass is 1.5 grams per cubic centimeter. And so that gives us per tree 6.6 .6 times 10 to the 6. That's over 6 million grams per tree. All right? What we're trying to do is get to moles here. So I have the mass of all the trees in the, um, the 14 million acres okay, times the mass per tree. And that gives us the mass, total mass, of all the trees in 14 million acres, which is 3.7 times 10 to the 15th grams. Now the amount of carbon in all of that mass is going to be about 0.4 because 40% of the cellulose is carbon. The rest is hydrogen and oxygen. So I take 0.4 times that, I get 1.5 times 10 to the 15 grams of carbon. Okay, now when all the amount of carbon dioxide, when all of that is burned, uh, we're going to have to multiply 44 grams of carbon dioxide per 12 grams of carbon. Okay. So I'm kind of magnifying this amount because of the oxygen that's in the carbon dioxide. And so that brings it up to 5.5 .5 times 10 to the 15 grams of carbon dioxide. All right? We're going to compare this to the amount of carbon dioxide we're adding to the atmosphere every year. So now if I want tons, I have to take grams and make it into pounds with 454 grams conversion. I have to take uh, pounds and make them into tons. We're going to use 2,000 uh, pounds per ton. And I get 6 times 10 to the 9th tons. Remember, 9, 10 to the 9 is giga. So giga is a billion, that's 10 to the 9th. So I'm, we are generating from the fires so far 6 gigatons of carbon dioxide released when the 14 million acres were burned, assuming that there's 40 eucalyptus trees per acre. Okay, so some of those assumptions might be off a little bit, but probably in the ballpark. So last year, there was 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere worldwide. And the fires that we've seen so far in Australia are 6 gigatons, right here, 6 gigatons. And that's about 15% of the total amount of carbon dioxide released in the earth and combustion of fossil fuels. So that is huge. Those fires are generating 15% of that total. And they're still burning. There's a lot more they expect to burn. Okay. So that carbon dioxide is just going into the atmosphere like everything else, and it'll be dispersed in the vegetation, the air, the oceans, the land. Okay. But it's definitely going to up the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now we could assume that the amount of heat generated is also proportional to the 15% um, approximately. Um, so if that's the case, then we would uh, also generate about 7.5 times 10 to the 19th joules. And in addition to the, uh, remember we had 5 times 10 to the 20th joules from all the fossil fuel combustion. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at how much heat is added to the earth every year by the buildup of the carbon dioxide and compare that to the amount of heat generated by the combustion of fossil fuels in a year. 
Okay. Now, in reality, researchers use very elaborate computer models to calculate what's going on from all the climate changes that are happening. And, um, you know, some of that's controversial, and um, how much we weight each factor is, is kind of um, a difficult decision. But what we're going to do is we're just going to assume everything comes from something called the Stefan Boltzmann Law. So Stefan Boltzmann Law allows us to look at any object uh, that's generating heat as a black body. So we have the sun, that's the biggest black body in our world, in our solar system. And then we also have the earth, which is a black body uh, generating uh, energy based on temperature. Okay, So it's a pretty simple law, Stefan Boltzmann Law, um, at, uh, says the total energy at some particular temperature is equal to the sigma, this constant, and the constant's right here, 5 times 10, 5.7 times 10 to the minus 8 watts. Now remember, a watt is a joule per second, amount of energy per second, per meter squared per Kelvin to the fourth. So there's a fourth power of temperature here. That's humongous. Okay, the temperature is going to be weighted to the fourth power. So if we knew the temperature, we could calculate the energy. And if we knew the energy, we could calculate the temperature. We'll actually use it both ways. Okay? So remember, we're getting at energy here, and energy is in the watts. That's a joule per second, and then square meter, whatever the uh, object is. So we're going to look at the sun. The sun has what they estimate about a 15 million degree Kelvin core, where all the fusion is going on with the hydrogen and the helium and other things. So tremendous amount of uh, heat coming out of here. But it doesn't get out to the surface for about 100,000 years. It takes to work it out. By the time it gets to the surface of the sun, the surface of the sun is about 5,800 degrees Kelvin, which is incredibly hot. But of course, it's not 15 million degrees. Now, if we wanted to figure out the energy coming out with this heat, we could come up here and use this Stefan Boltzmann law. We know what sigma is, and we know the temperature is 5,800 to the fourth power, okay? And so if we put all that in up here and calculate it out, it comes out 6.4 times 10 to the seventh watts per meter squared, okay? 6.7 times 10 to the 6.4 times 10 to the 7 is 64 million watts per meter squared. Now, a meter squared is pretty small. That's about 3 feet by 3 feet. Okay? And we're talking about the entire surface of the sun. So if we come over here and look at the sun, it has a diameter uh, about uh, 1.4 million kilometers. So we make that into meters. That's 10 to the 9th meters. And then the radius is half of that, so 7 times 10 to the 8th. We're going to figure out the area, 4 pi r squared. So when we calculate that, we have 6 times 10 to the 18th square meters, meters squared. If we come over here, each one of those has 64 million watts per meter squared. So we could figure out the total energy by multiplying all of these square meters times that amount per square meter, and we get 4 times 10 to the 26 watts, joules per second. Okay, that's a lot of energy coming out of the sun. Now, how does this work with the Earth? Okay, so the Stefan Boltzmann uh, black body energy says uh, it's going to be 6.4 times 10 to the 7th watts per square meter. Now, that's radiating out in all directions, but we're only concerned with the amount, this little tiny sliver that comes out heading towards Earth. By the time it gets to the Earth, it's gone about uh, 93, 94 million miles. And so the amount of energy at that particular little sliver is a lot less. It's reduced down to about 1,370 watts per meter squared at the surface of the Earth. Okay. Now, half of the Earth doesn't even see the sun. Half of the Earth is away. So we're going to reduce the amount of square meters by the watts per square meter by half. And then the other problem is some of the lights coming across the, the North Pole and the South Pole just barely glancing the Earth while the light coming at the middle is a head-on getting all of that energy. And so that uh, requires us to reduce it by another half, and so a half times a half is a fourth. And so we're only getting about a fourth of the energy that's actually coming into the Earth's environment. Okay, so we take a fourth, and that would be 342 watts per square meter. Now, it's even less than this. 
because the light that enters into the Earth's atmosphere and the surface of the Earth, some of it is reflected, about 30%. So about 30% is reflected back to space. They call that the albedo. And so only 70% of this actually makes it uh, into the Earth's atmosphere and environment. Okay. So what should Earth's temperature be if that's the amount of energy coming in? So we take our 342 watts per square meter times 0.7, because 30% is reflected, and that gives us 240 watts. We put it into the Stefan Boltzmann equation, and uh, we're going to solve for T. So we bring uh, the sigma over to the other side. We have T to the fourth equals that ratio. Okay, so that's a pretty pretty big number because this is so small, 4.2 times 10 to the ninth. But remember, we're raising this to the fourth power. So if we take the fourth root of t to the fourth of this number here, we get 255 degrees Kelvin based on 30% of the sun's energy being reflected and no greenhouse effect. Okay, now that's pretty doggone cold. Okay, if we come down here, 255 degrees Kelvin is minus 18 degrees Celsius and zero degrees Fahrenheit. Remember, 32 degrees Fahrenheit is freezing. We're 32 degrees below freezing, or 18 degrees Celsius below freezing, with no greenhouse effect. Now, our world couldn't survive. We can't live in a world that's at minus 18 degrees Celsius. We couldn't grow crops. We'd be frozen all the time. So there's something else going on here. So the other thing that's going on is that we have greenhouse gases in our Earth. We have things like water, carbon dioxide, methane, and these gases have the ability to pick up energy from the Earth's surface and their atmosphere and make the Earth warmer. So in fact, the Earth's real temperature is about 288 degrees Kelvin. Okay, so now we're going to take the Stefan Boltzmann law and turn it around. We're going to work it the other way. We know the temperature, so we can put that in there and raise it to the fourth power and then the Stefan Boltzmann constant. And so what that tells us is that the total energy is not 240 that we got from the sun. The total energy is 392. That's 152 more than the 240. So where did this come from? Well, it comes from the greenhouse gases, the water, the carbon dioxide, the methane that are uh, heating up the earth. So this is kind of a little schematic, pretty crude. Sorry about that. But I have the sun out here. It's sending us its energy. Remember, coming off the sun at 64 million watts per square meter. And by the time it gets to the Earth, it's reduced down to 1370. And we take one-fourth of that. So that's coming in here. Now, some of that, about 30%, is going to be reflected out. It's reflected by the clouds. It's reflected by white on the surface of the Earth. So the North Pole, the South Pole, any place where there's snow or ice reflected out. So we're losing about 100 watts per square meter. Some of it's absorbed by the atmosphere, okay? Some of it's absorbed at the surface of the earth. Okay, so this is this is energy that we actually get. This is the 240. Okay, I have 241 over here because we're actually gaining a little bit from the greenhouse gases um, that are accumulating. That's about 70 percent coming in. So now when the sun comes from the, uh, the light comes from the sun, it's visible light because of the temperature that it's, it's at over here. So when, that's what we can see. We can see things uh, because the visible light allows us to, to see in the way our eyes have evolved. But when it hits the Earth, it's absorbed at the surface of the Earth and readmitted as IR. And our eyes cannot see IR, but we can feel IR as heat. So we get this uh, heat coming off the surface. Now the molecules in the atmosphere are banging into the surface and a lot of them, like the nitrogen, the oxygen, the argon, they're not IR active. But water, carbon dioxide, and methane, they are IR active. So when they collide into the Earth, they get excited into excited states. And then they bounce around in the atmosphere and transfer their energy back to other molecules. And um, get, they re relax down to the ground state. And then they get re-excited from other molecules bouncing into them. And this can go up or down, front or back, left or right. And so the energy is bounced around and spread throughout. It doesn't just like bounce out and get reflected. 
it stays here and redistributes itself among all the uh, molecules that are in the atmosphere. And so that's where the extra energy, the 392 watts, comes off here, is from that, um, that mixing of all those uh, molecules excited in ground states going back and forth. Now, the uh, carbon dioxide can uh, help heat up the atmosphere. Remember, the 70% of the Earth is water. And so the water can go into the, uh, the vapor phase, and that's where it can distribute that IR energy. But the carbon dioxide can help increase the temperature of the water, and that increases the vapor pressure. So we call that a feedback mechanism. So it can make itself hotter if we accumulate more and more of these greenhouse gases. So this is just to show where the energy is coming from in the sun. The sun really has a distribution, but most of the energy at 5,800 degree uh, temperature is coming in the visible right here. Remember, that was about 60 million watts per square meter. So we're talking tens of millions over here on this scale. Right? So here's our visible. But there's a little bit ultraviolet. This is something we have to be careful of because the ultraviolet can break chemical bonds that are in biological systems, and that would be deadly to the system. Fortunately, we have some protection from uh, ozone in, in our uh, stratosphere. Uh, and then also it has some lower energy forms, the IR. Now notice the IR, I have to draw just like a line here. It's so small, I, it wouldn't fit on a scale that's tens of millions. So what I did was I rewrote the Earth's uh, black body radiation. The Earth's black body radiation is IR. Okay, that's the main amount. And then some lower energy of microwaves and so forth. But these are tens of watts per square meter, and these are tens of millions of watts per square meter. Okay, so again, the Stefan Boltzmann's law, according to the Earth's temperature uh, of 288, is like 392. So this extra energy that's coming here is coming from that IR uh, radiation exciting the uh, greenhouse gases. So the composition of our atmosphere is, if we assume a million parts, it's almost 78% uh, nitrogen. Nitrogen's not IR active. It's just a very simple molecule, two nitrogens. You need a difference of atoms here that lead to a difference in polarity, and they have to be able to bend and vibrate and so forth. Nitrogen uh, doesn't have that ability, and neither does oxygen. Oxygen has two oxygen molecules, the same, connected, and neither does argon, because argon's not even a molecule, it's an atom. So none of these are IR active, okay, but they are moving around the atmosphere, they're gases. And then we come to water. So water is uh, variable, because we have dry deserts, and we have humid ocean shores at high temperatures. And so uh, water can be all over the place in terms of parts per million, depending where you are. But I just picked 2,000 parts per million here okay, for the water. Very strong um, IR absorber. And then we have carbon dioxide. For thousands of years, carbon dioxide has been running around 280 parts per million. Okay? Or actually tens of thousands of years. Um, but very recently, when um, we had the Industrial Revolution, they invented the steam engine, we started burning coal and then oil and then natural gas. And so we're cranking out carbon dioxide going crazy. And so we've gone from about 280, maybe 250 years ago, to uh, today we're around 415 parts per million. So that we've been increasing by greater and greater amounts. And actually, this last year was almost three parts per million increase. And so it's going up faster and faster. And what we need is we need to stop it. So let's just take a look. How much carbon dioxide is there in air? compared to the uh, million parts here. So there's only like one carbon dioxide per 2,400 other molecules out there. Seems like nothing. Water, uh, we're assuming 2,000 parts per million. So that's like one out of 500. Still pretty small, but quite a bit more than the carbon dioxide. And if we looked at methane, methane is only about two parts per million. That's one out of 500,000. It seems like that's so insignificant. But the problem with methane is uh, when it first comes out, one for one, it's about 80 times stronger IR absorber than the carbon dioxide over here. But over about 10 or 20 years, it gets oxidized by the oxygen in the air and becomes carbon dioxide. 
but we always have sort of this steady state background. Okay, methane used to be pretty low, about 0.7 or so, and it's also increased over the last uh, 250 years, so it's running almost to, it's about 1.8. So, overall, water is the main greenhouse gas. That's the most important. Um, clouds, which is basically just another form of water, is about 25%, water is about 50%. So this is the bulk of the greenhouse gases. Okay, but water is in and out. It's, it goes in and out of the atmosphere maybe in a couple weeks. So there's not much we can do about that because 70% of the Earth is water. But carbon dioxide is the next one, and that's about 20% of the greenhouse gases, the greenhouse effect. And then the other ones, uh, methane and some other ones I didn't really mention, are about 5%. Okay, so water equilibrates fast, but carbon dioxide can last for hundreds to thousands of years, even longer. And um, carbon dioxide helps warm the atmosphere. So the more carbon dioxide we put in, then the higher the temperature can go. It can affect the water, because of its higher temperature, it can affect the vapor pressure in the water, which puts more water in the atmosphere. And remember, water is a biggie up here. And so that's going to be sort of an ex accentuating effect. It's a, what they call a feedback system. And then the extra temperature makes more water go in and so forth. Okay, so carbon dioxide is one of the triggers that can start things happening. Okay, it's not the only one, but it's an important one. One that we really don't want to happen is methane. Okay, right now methane's staying pretty low. But there's stores of methane out there that could possibly get released, and then that would make everything go faster. So, uh, basically what's happening is the water or the carbon dioxide is absorbing some IR photon. It's getting excited. It bangs into other molecules, transfers its energy back to the, throughout the atmosphere. Okay, water can hit an oxygen or a nitrogen. Carbon dioxide can hit a nitrogen or an oxygen or an argon. Okay, so it's going to change the kinetic energy of those guys, increase it, it but then it relaxes. But there's more IR always being radiated from the surface of the Earth and in the atmosphere, and that excites it and it transfers and relaxes and so forth over and over. Uh, now, a lot of people say, how could such a little amount, say, of carbon dioxide cause this effect? Because there's only one out of 2,400. But a little analogy I think of when I think of this is I think of a game of pool. So the carbon dioxide is like the cue ball, or the water is like the cue ball. And uh, the pool stick is like the IR radiation. So you take that pool stick, you hit the cue ball, and it crashes into the other balls on the table. You never once use the cue stick to hit the other balls. You only hit the cue ball. But by the end of the game, almost every ball is in the hole from the pool stick and the cue ball going back and forth. And so these, these molecules, water and carbon dioxide, can bang around here and hit all these other molecules many, many times over and over and over. Now the other thing to think about, if, if carbon dioxide is so insignificant, how does it feed all the plants and plankton on Earth? Okay, just walk outside and take a look at the trees. Think of the Amazon rainforest. Think of the boreal forest that's up in the north, say in Canada. That's a tremendous amount of material, and carbon it's carbon dioxide that feeds those guys. Okay. Now, this just shows a little history of what we're talking about in terms of the carbon dioxide. There's a lot of things I, I'm not talking about here because I'm trying to make it a little shorter. Uh, but we have these up and down... Uh, cycles of carbon dioxide. It goes up to almost 300, usually doesn't hit 300, and then it goes back down to about 180, up and down, up and down, up and down. And as it does this, the temperature goes with it. The temperature goes up and down and up and down. Okay, so they're, they're somewhat related. And as the temperature changes, the amount of water versus ice on the earth changes. When it's warmer, we have less ice, we have more water. And when it's colder, we have more ice and less water. So, and when it's colder, we have an ice age. These can be huge, like one mile, two mile thick um, glaciers. They extend all the way down to Europe or, or uh, New York. And when it's warmer, we have, um, we call it an interglacial period where it's um, more comfortable. Okay, so that's been going on for hundreds of thousands of years. These are related to what they call the Milankovitch cycles. And other things too, the carbon dioxide is tied in with those 
but we don't have time to go into every detail on that. But about uh, 12,000 years ago, we hit this really climate sweet spot. Okay, and that's when human, modern humans, started developing language and agriculture and cities and things like that. Okay, so that's been about the same, about 280 for about 12,000 years. Until about 250 years ago, uh, James Watt invented that steam engine, a good one. And so then we started burning a lot of coal, and that's increased ever since. And so now, this, is, uh, this stops at about 2017, 405. But currently, we're about 415 parts per million carbon dioxide. Look at how that has changed from hundreds of thousands of years. Almost never made it over 300. And now we're shooting up in just a few decades. Okay? Now, as many people have pointed out, the world doesn't have a problem. Okay, the world's lived with a lot higher carbon dioxide levels than we have now. If you go back uh, in millions of years, you can find where it was as high as maybe 6,000 parts per million. And so then people say, oh, well, 6,000, there's no problem. Okay, and that's, that's right. There's no problem with uh, the Earth. And some of them go back. When you go back to those times, there, there wasn't really life on Earth, uh, on land. Okay, most of the life was in the ocean. And so there were a lot of things that were different. Also, the sun has increased its intensity almost 50% since it started 4.5 billion years ago. Okay, it's about 50% more intense. So having those higher carbon dioxides a long, long time ago was actually very helpful to keeping the world warm enough for life to live because the sun was colder. So, uh, and also, the earth had no houses, had no roads, had no people. Okay, people have only been on the scene in the last couple hundred thousand years. And so um, when they say that there's no difference, there's, there's no problem with high carbon dioxide levels, they're talking about a different world. We're talking about a world that has people over every continent. Even Antarctica has a few people down there. But there's cities, there's roads, like 40% of the people live along the coastline. Okay, we can't have sea level rising 20 feet when uh, we have a world that we have today. Okay, it's just not going to work. Plus, we have, you know, if you went back, uh, say, 12,000 years ago, there's there's just a handful of people, you know, maybe 14 million people. Now, we're approaching billions, you know, maybe by the 2100, we might have 10, 11 billion people. So we can't have the same kind of world we had when the carbon dioxide was uh, higher levels, 600, 6,000 parts per million. Okay, our world is different. Now this just shows recent times what's going on. Okay, remember parts per million up here, 415. We want this to be a lot lower. We would prefer that it was like 280 like it used to be. But now we're at 415 and we're going up. If you look here's 1960, we were going up a little less than one, maybe one sometimes. And in 1980, we're going up about one and a half. And then 2000, we're going up about two parts per million. And 2020, the last few years, we've been going up three parts per million. Three parts per million. If we just continued at that level, doesn't look like we are. Looks like we're increasing. Why would we increase? Well, we have more people in China and India and America, all over the world. <clears throat> Maybe nine billion people by 2050. By 2050, if we just go at three parts per million, we'll be at 475. Okay, not 415, 475. 2100, if we keep going at three parts per million, we'll be at 625. We haven't seen this in tens of millions of years. Okay? This is not the world of tens of millions of years ago. This is the world of today, of a world with, you know, 9, 10 billion people on the earth. So it can't work the same. Also, other animals and plants had the ability to adapt and move based on the, uh, the changing climate, which they cannot do today because we've covered most of the earth with human uh, developments. So those, those animals are stuck. They can't move. And plus we're changing about 20 to 30 times faster in terms of temperature and uh, other things. So the animal life just can't respond to that. Plant life can't respond to that. They can't move that fast. So we need a world that's not changing in carbon dioxide. Okay, we need a world that's going back to around 280, which isn't really reasonable.
where we are now. So let's compare now the amount of energy added to Earth for each degree increase above the energies we just calculated. Okay, so what's going to happen? So we're going to take the world of 288 degrees Kelvin, and we're going to make it 289 degrees Kelvin. Okay, that one degree, we didn't even want that. Okay, we wanted to keep it actually at the, where it was. But from the Paris Accord, they started saying, well, let's try and keep it at 1.5 and no more. Well, that's a pipe dream. We've gone past that. Okay, we're going to go all the way up to 6 degrees in our little experiment here, little calculation, and we'll see how catastrophic that really is. Okay, looking at that energy that we're adding into the world. Okay, so that's if we do nothing. We're looking at six degrees. So I'm only going to, I'm only going to show two calculations. The first one is the energy the um, energy that comes out from 288. This is the Stebbin Boltzmann law. We already did this. We got out 392 watts per square meter. And then I'm going to add one degree. Remember this took ten to temperature to the fourth power. So now I got 398 watts per square meter. It looks pretty small. It's only what six watts different per square meter. The problem is the square meters. There's so many of them on Earth. Okay, so we need the area of Earth. And the area of Earth is 5.2 times 10 to the 14th square miles. And we need the temperature, I'm sorry, the time of the year in seconds, because we're going for a whole year. So that's 32 million seconds per year. So if we come down here and look at this, we have 392 joules per second, that's the watt, per square meter. And so I have 5.2 times 10 to the 14th, oh, that uh, should be meters, uh, square meters, for 3.2 times 10 to the 7 seconds, and that comes out to be 6.5 times 10 to the 24 joules. Huge number, huge. We add one degree to that. So now we have 398 times these big numbers, this is meters, not miles, times the 32 million seconds, and now we get 6.62 times 10 to the 24th. These numbers look pretty close. They don't look that different. Let's take a look. Okay, so we're going to take the difference between these two to figure out how much extra energy did we add in from that one degree. All right, so if I do that, I get 0 0.1. But the problem is I'm multiplying that by 10 to the 24th. I'm going to take one of those 10s out and make it a 1 times 10 to the 23rd joules. This is the extra energy we added from 1 degree increase. Okay, that's the extra energy. So now we can come back and calculate a ratio between this extra energy from 1 degree and all the fossil fuel energy combusted in one year, which we said was really a lot, okay, that was 10 to the 20th. So if we take this 1 times 10 to the 23rd and divide it by 5 times 10 to the 20, we get a 200 to 1 ratio. The extra energy from one degree is 200 times bigger than all the fossil fuel combusted in one year. Okay. Remember, all the fossil fuel combusted in one year was the equivalent of an atomic bomb going off every three seconds. And now we're doing that 200 times faster. So this becomes the equivalent of 62 atomic bombs per second in terms of energy. Now remember, that's spread over the entire world and over the entire time of a year. So it's not quite the same as blowing up an atomic bomb but it is still an incredible amount of energy that we're adding per second to the giant uh, volume of the Earth. Okay. So, uh, the problem with the carbon dioxide is it doesn't go away. Okay, It lasts hundreds to thousands of years. And we keep adding it in, and it keeps adding to the stuff that's already there, increasing this even more. Okay. Last year we added 40 more gigatons, and we're probably doing the same this year. We hope we're not going up, but we might be. So what I did here was I looked at each temperature increase at a time. 1 degree, 2 degrees, 3 degrees, 4 degrees, 5 degrees, 6 degrees. And this is the amount of energy that comes out per square meter 
for each of these increases in temperature. Okay. So Earth's new total energy, if I multiply by all of the square meters and all of the time for a year, looks like this. Okay, so we just saw 1 times 10 to the 23rd was the 1 degree increase, and that was a 200 to 1 ratio of the extra energy from the 1 degree divided by the total fossil fuel combusted in a year. Well, if I increase by 2 degrees, it's going to be about twice as much. If I increase by 3 degrees, it's going to be about 3 times as much. Okay, so look at this. We're talking 370 to 1, 580 to 1. If I come down, if, if we should happen to hit 6 degree increase, that is 1100 to 1 times more energy than all of the fossil fuel we're burning, uh, energy from all the fossil fuel we're burning in a year. Uh, it's, it's almost unbelievable in so much. Okay. So, uh, we're looking at, you know, one year fossil fuel, that's atomic bomb per three seconds, or all of the energy, at, all the carbon dioxide added in there, increasing the temperature one degree. Carbon dioxide plus water plus methane plus everything else that's uh, in there with it. That's 62 Hiroshima atomic bombs per second. Okay, so I just want to make a distinction here because it, it sounds a little bit uh, uh, unreal. The Hiroshima atomic bomb releases all its energy at one point, which is basically a six square mile uh, area, in one second. So all of that energy is coming at that instant and just focus into that six square miles. The extra carbon dioxide from climate change is a lot. Okay? It's way more energy, but it's spread over all of the Earth um, in six square mile plots, okay, and in one year of seconds, thirty about thirty two million seconds, and so that comes out to be about twenty two hundred joules, which isn't really that much per second per six square mile plot. Whereas the atomic bomb's energy is fifty, let's see, millions, billions, trillions, fifty trillion joules per second per that six mile plot, basically instantaneously pumping it all in. So what I want to look at, uh, the final thing that we're getting to, is uh, melting ice in Greenland. That's our example of what the consequence of this extra energy is. Uh, it's said that if we increase the temperature 2 degrees uh, of Earth, uh, that will melt all the ice in Greenland. But the problem is it usually takes thousands of years, because Earth tends to do it very slowly. Incre the temperature increases at a slow rate. Uh, but we're doing it fast. We've gone up over one degree in the last hundred years. Okay, that is mind-boggling in terms of the speed of increase. One degree. Remember, that's what we're talking about in terms of the energy that we were just looking at, one degree increase. So we're going way faster. Uh, so we don't know how fast Greenland ice can melt, but we're going to take a look at that, at those possibilities. So you know, there's a lot of uncertainties in what I'm calculating here. And so um, this isn't like absolute absolutely predicted and going to happen it's a um, it's an estimation now first off how how high would sea level rise well uh, Greenland's about 840,000 square miles glaciers we're going to say it's around 600 cubic miles so this is a volume of ice that's going to turn into a volume of water okay the area of the earth 4 pi r squared uh, assuming the radius is 4,000 miles, comes out to a little over 200 million mi square miles. 70% is water, so we're going to take 70% of that, 141 million square miles. And then we're going to take this volume of ice and make it into volume of water that's going to be added to this area right here. And we want to know how high does it go up. So we're going to solve for H. Okay, so we solve for H. We take that volume of ice, which becomes volume of water, we divide by the total area of all the water, we get 0 0.0042 miles. Sounds kind of small, but remember a mile is 5,280 feet, and so when we multiply them out, it comes out about, I have here 22 feet sea level rise, and I've seen 20 to 24 feet in that range. Okay, 20 to 24 feet sea level rise. If all of that ice melts, okay, and Greenland represents about 15% of all the ice on Earth. About 85% is uh, in Antarctica, and about uh, a little less than 1% is in the glaciers all around the Earth. Okay, so now we want to look at the amount of time it would take to melt that ice. Okay, 
So we'll take a look here. We need to look at the specific heat capacity of ice. That's about two joules per degree per gram because we're going to have to heat up the ice. And then when we get to the melting point, uh, we have to melt the ice, and that takes a lot more energy because we're breaking down the structure of the ice. 334 joules per gram. Okay. So we need some amounts. Okay, we have 600,000 cubic miles. We need to convert that to grams because that's what we have up here, grams. So we convert it to meters, cubic meters, and then we convert it to cubic centimeters from meters. And then one gram is about the same as a cubic centimeter. And so we can just uh, multiply that and get the grams. So we do it, we get 2.4 times 10 to the 21 grams of ice in Greenland. Again, these are huge numbers. Okay, it's just really big. That's all we can think of. Now, in our thought experiment, what we're going to do is we're going to take ice that's one degree below zero and warm it. And then we'll take it to the uh, freezing point where it starts to melt. And then we're going to melt it. Okay, so the energy to warm all the ice, one degree, we set up here the specific heat capacity of ice is 2.1 joules. So we have to take all that those grams of ice, and we have to warm them up 2.1 joules per degree per gram. We get 5 times 10 to the 21 joules, an incredible amount of energy. Now we have to calculate the energy to melt it all. Okay, Well, that's going to be way more, because we have 2.4 times 10 to the 21 grams. We have to melt each of those by 334 joules per gram, so we get 8 times 10 to the 23rd joules. Well, this is 10 to the 21, this is 10 to the 23rd, so I, what I wanted to do is make them both 10 to the 21. So I took out 100 and multiplied it times 8, so I got 800 times 10 to the 21, and I'm comparing that to 5 times 10 to the 21, and so we're going to ignore the 5. It's so small compared to 800. So we're just going to use this amount here, the energy to melt the ice. That's a lot of energy, but how does it compare with how much energy we have to put into Earth to warm it one degree Celsius, okay? Because we're comparing that amount of energy that's happened because we've increased one degree to the amount of energy that can make this happen, melt all the ice in Greenland. Okay, so the energy from our extra one degree increase in temperature, we said was one times 10 to the 23rd joules, okay? The energy to melt all the ice in Greenland, we said was eight times 10 to the 23rd joules. They're pretty close. They're both 10 to the 23rd. Okay, to melt the ice, we need eight times that amount of energy for that one degree increase for one year. Okay, remember this this is one year, but the next year it's going to be there, and the next year it's going to be there. Okay, so that's a one to eight ratio. Now, uh, if we assumed all of that energy, let's come down here, if we assume all this energy goes into melting the Greenland ice, one day ratio. It would take us like eight years to melt all that, melt all that ice. That's incredibly fast to melt all the ice in Greenland. Well, it's not going to all go to Greenland because we have all the rest of the world that's out there. Okay, so it's going to go all around the world. So if we look at the, say we say it's one tenth that amount, then it might take 80 years. Okay, but say it's one hundredth that amount, then it might take 800 years. So we have a variable time frame here, depending on how much of the energy from that one degree increase is going into melting the ice. Say it took 1,000 years, 1,000th of it went in, it would take 8,000 years. Okay, this is more like geological time that we're used to seeing. But remember, we're heating it up way faster. We've already gone, done one degree in about 100 years. Okay, and we're not slowing down. We're going faster. So let's say it was two degrees. So if we heat it up two degrees, then everything goes faster. The time scales, you only need 4.2 years to melt all the ice. Okay, And then if it was one-tenth of that, it would take 42 years. And if it was one-hundredth of that, it would take 420 years. Well, we're almost for sure we're going to see two degrees. Okay? We're hoping we don't see three, but likelihood is we will. Four would be worse, five, and so forth. So if we come down here and say, look at six degrees, Remember, six degrees, that's hardly anything. Um, we could melt all the ice in Greenland if it went into just melting the ice in 1.4 years. That's like instantaneous. If one-tenth was there, it would be 14 years. One one-hundredth, 140 years. 
one one thousandth, fourteen hundred years. Even this is super fast in terms of geological time. But let's just say we, we hit three degrees, okay? So uh, let's say only one one hundredth of the energy goes uh, into melting the ice, and so in about three hundred years, we would melt all the ice in Greenland. And so then you say, okay, well, that's, that's a pretty long time, you know, none of us are going to be around. But remember, that's 20, about, let's say, 24 feet elevation gain, 24 feet. So that means per 100 years, we'd be going up about 8 feet. So by the end of the century, sea level rise could be about 8 feet if we increase the 3 degrees, and 1 one hundredth of that energy goes into melting the ice. Think of sea levels, eight feet taller. Okay, New York, Boston, Washington, D.C., Florida, Bangladesh, San Francisco. These are all going to be flooded. Okay, they're in big, big trouble. Just in less than 100 years by the end of the century. Okay, so this is what we're looking at. We're looking at some really serious problems. Okay, now, remember, two degrees, three degrees, four degrees. Everything happens faster. This, this is utterly shocking to our world. Now, it's not going to hurt the Earth. The Earth is going to be fine. Earth has had the sea level go up hundreds of feet and go down hundreds of feet. Okay, it's people that have a problem. We have become the dominant life form on this Earth, and we built along every single coastline, and um, we have people all over the Earth, and we have to grow, grow a lot of food, uh, to sustain ourselves and have a lot of land where we can live and have comfortable uh, temperatures and environment. So it's us that has a problem. So this is what uh, this is something called the IP, IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They put out a report about every five years or so. I have a little URL that you can look at. So this is uh, their projections based on cute, uh, computer models. Okay. My, my stuff is not a computer model. I'm just going off of energy. Okay, so you can see about 1990, here we were, <coughs> excuse me, putting out about 20 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. Well, we didn't stop. Look what happened. Here we are about 2020. We're up around 40 gigatons that we're putting out. Okay, so this is where we really are. Now, the computer models have all these different predictions for different scenarios. So this is like the dream world. This says, oh, look, at, we're going to come down. We're going to quit putting carbon dioxide out. We're going to actually start to reduce it. We're going to come down to these levels right here, bring it back to what it was. Okay, well, that's a dream. I, I call that the pretend Paris goals. Now, if we follow this line, some of these lines down here towards back, uh, there's a probability that we'll hit these different temperature increases. Okay, I took this information over here. I, I rewrote it in a, a tabular form here. So this particular goal says we're only going to hit 1.5 degree increase. This says we're going to go up to 2. This says we're going to go up to 3. This says we're going to go up to 4. This says we're going to go over 4 degrees increase. Now, even with this pretend goal, okay, which is impossible, we can't even do this, it says we only have a 15% chance of staying at 1.5. 35% chance of going to 2. 45% chance of going to 3. You see what the problem is. Remember, we were just talking about 3 degrees about 300 years, and we raised sea levels eight feet by the end of the century. Okay. Well, uh, let's say we're a little more ambitious. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna try and do something. So we we follow this line down here. We have a little ambition. We're gonna try to work towards uh, cutting the carbon dioxide and so forth. So uh, 1.5 is out of the picture. Okay. We're looking at to 2 degrees, it's 22 percent. 3 degrees, 3 degrees is looking like the most probable one. Even 4 degrees, over 4 degrees, has a little tiny chance, but not much, 1 percent. Well, let's say we make a little better effort. We make some effort for the Paris goals, but you know, not real ambitious. And so now the number one uh, scenario is that we go up 3 degrees. But actually, a third probability, 34% chance we could go up 4 degrees, and a 7% chance we will go over 4. Now think about it. If you were going to get on a plane, and they told you you have a 7% chance that that plane is going to crash, you wouldn't get on the plane. Okay? 
7% chance that plane's going to crash. But we have a 7% chance we'll go over 4 degrees, and that is mind-boggling. Okay, let's say we make a feeble effort, which is what we're doing. We're making a feeble effort. And so now, all of a sudden, the best scenario is the 4-degree rise. Even the over 4-degree rise has about a third, 34% chance. And if we don't do anything, we just like keep cranking it out, then we're looking at these lines up here. Okay, and we're going to get up so high that now the most probable scenario is that we're going to go over 4, and now it's a disaster. Okay, how are we going to feed everybody in the world? How are we going to have everybody live? What are all the hundreds of millions of people going to do when their homes get flooded? They're going to have to go somewhere, mass migrations and so forth. So, you know, it's, it's a pretty dire situation if we don't do anything. So let me just point out again the difference between my calculation versus a computer model. Okay, my calculation depends on a single equation, Stanley Boltzmann law. Temperature predicts energy, and energy predicts temperature. Okay, and I use those energies to show possibilities with the Greenland ice. Okay, these are all possible, all my possible changes are lumped into just these two variables of temperature and energy. I don't have any specifics about feedbacks and ice and all that kind of stuff. It's just a very simple calculation based on the Stephen Boltzmann law. Now the computer models, they're super complicated. I couldn't even tell you how they work. There's so many things programmed in there. And uh, they consider many, many factors. Like This just shows you some of the possibilities here. Latitude, longitude, pressure gradients, temperature gradients, uh, vegetation, snow and ice, melt water, ice areas. It's just a bunch of stuff. Okay? And there's dozens of models. And they don't all consider everything the same way. But they, what they do is they try to look at the models together and see what the models predict as a combined um, prediction from all of them. Look for the, the best possible uh, predictions. Okay. So, the various factors that are considered in these models, I listed a lot of them here. Greenhouse gases, we got all these guys. Solar luminosity, volcanic eruptions, Milankovitch cycles, land use changes, deforest, deforestation, fires, and new growth, aerosols, soot, clouds, El Nino's, southern oscillation currents, okay, feedbacks, more water vapor uh, from higher temperatures, um, and then makes more higher temperature. Reduction in snow or ice cover, that's a reduced albedo. We absorb more energy at the surface of the earth. Methane leakage from permafrost uh, melting. We have uh, droughts, floods. Both of them increase because the water transport changes. Mega storms, variations in temperature uh, based on increased by latitudes. Better plant growth for more carbon dioxide, that's a good thing, but worse plant growth because of hotter temperatures and drier soils, that's a bad thing. What are we going to do? Societal response. Are we going to just do nothing? No fossil change in fossil fuels? Just keep cranking it out? Or do we do a vigorous reduction of fossil fuels with alternative energies such as solar, wind, and so forth? We have possibilities there. We have to, we have to do something. We have to be smart. Uh, more humidity plus heat, say at the equator, that's deadly. People can't even live there. Uh, more random weather. It's hotter some places, colder some places. Um, Melting of land glaciers. This is a very dangerous uh, situation because these glaciers supply water for billions of people, say like in um, the Himalayas, Pakistan, India, China. Billions of people, they need that water. If the glaciers all melt, then they don't have it. Uh, so uh, they can have mass migrations that change agricultural, domestic, animals, human uses. Uh, you know, land patterns change. So computer models, they put everything in there that seems reasonable, and they, they fudge them a little bit and change them and stuff. They try to make predictions. Okay, One thing that uh, a lot of computer models do is they make little cells of, around the Earth in the atmosphere. Okay, And so they, they make, uh, uh, in terms of altitude going up, they have different cells, and in terms of uh, longitude and latitude, they have uh, different cells. And these become like little data sets for the computer to calculate, but there's so many in the whole volume of the Earth that you need supercomputers to do this. And so, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty, and people who poo-poo this, who discount it, they take advantage of that uncertainty and say it's not real. Uh, but you better believe it's real, 
and uh, you better believe we got to do something. Okay, so to me, the really hard part, the really hard variable is human behavior. Okay, can we find the discipline and will to modify our comfortable habits into new behaviors? This is the tough part. Our life is good. Okay, uh, so probably what we're going to need is more catastrophic disasters, say like the fires in Australia. When you look at those fires, you start to believe, you start to have fear, and uh, that may allow you to change habits up here. So uh, with that, maybe we can be convinced that climate change is real, and we have to take some drastic steps. Okay, my guess is that we also need some good examples of what is possible. Okay, examples that we can copy, examples that we can spread around the world to show us that this can happen. Okay, right now we're, we just don't know. If we knew there was a certain plan that worked, you know, maybe we could act on that. So we need like super efficient people to build super efficient houses. Then some super efficient businesses to create good business models that we can follow. Okay, not just to make money for themselves, but to save the earth. We need some super efficient cities to reorganize city services. Okay, consumption, pollution, all these things. We need super efficient states to do the same for state services. And then we need some super efficient nations to create like a carbon fee, a carbon dividend fee, where we have a motivation to reduce our use of fossil fuels. Um, we need to build better electrical grids that can be combined with the solar and the wind and the other sources of electricity that we can generate. And we need to do, do this so that we can show the world what is possible. Okay. Now those that get started on this and get going, and people are doing it, Okay, they're starting, but it's just not enough yet. We have to have the whole world working on this. They're going to be ahead. Okay, They're going to have the new ideas and the new technology. And so um, that will help uh, them and advance their, their world on better. Okay, So some countries are trying this. Okay, and so I say, let the competition begin. Let's get out there and start you know, saving the world. And that's the end. Thank you for listening.